in our headlines on this Wednesday afternoon, May 22nd, here in South Korea. World leaders partaking in the AI Seoul Summit reaffirmed their commitment to safe, innovative and inclusive applications of artificial intelligence while seeking guardrails against its potential abuse. And Russia starts exercises simulating the launch of tactical nuclear weapons in what pundits believe is a warning to authorities in the West who suggest deeper involvement in the war in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Korea's producer price index rose for the fifth month in a row in April, gaining 0.3% on month amid a hike in prices for services and industrial goods. The virtual leaders session of the AI Seoul Summit Tuesday evening saw the adoption of the Seoul Declaration, in which participants stressed the importance of fair and productive AI applications. Our senior correspondent, Oh Soo Young, reports. South Korea, the United Kingdom, the United States and other world powers have called for stronger global cooperation to advance safety, innovation and inclusion in artificial intelligence to further human well-being and democratic values. This came in a joint Seoul declaration following the AI's Seoul summit co-hosted by South Korea and the UK. On Tuesday evening's Seoul time, President Yoon suk yeol and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak chaired the first closed-door session online, attended by the leaders of the Group of Seven Nations and Singapore and the Vice Presidents of the United States and the European Commission. In his opening remarks, Yoon said that given the hyper-connectivity and borderless nature of the digital space, the world needs common digital norms to first ensure the safety of AI, minimizing the potential negative impact on societies and protecting well-being and democracy. He also called for free and open innovation to stimulate economic growth and tackle global problems like climate change, as well as to ensure all people benefit from the technology. Such points were reflected in this whole declaration reached by the participating countries and Australia. That document calls for enhanced cooperation on governing AI to mitigate risks, while promoting democratic values, human rights, the rule of law and fundamental freedoms. It also raises the need for policy and governance frameworks that support socio-cultural and gender diversity, contribute to sustainable development and help bridge the digital divide. To increase the shared understanding and design of such frameworks, a separate whole statement of intent builds on previous commitments to strengthen global research collaboration on AI safety. The two days Ho summit is a follow-up to the first AI safety summit held in England's Bletchley Park last year, where 28 governments recognised the significant challenges posed by AI, including in cybersecurity, biotechnology and the dissemination of misinformation. While 10 countries and the European Union adopted this whole declaration, you noted it was reached by the heads of state and government, marking an upgrade from last year's ministerial Bletchley declaration. It also expanded the scope of focus from AI safety to include innovation and inclusivity. Recognising the need to engage the core developers of AI, the summit also included leaders of 11 IT giants, including Samsung Electronics, Naver, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta and X who agreed to adopt the voluntary AI safety commitments to prevent AI-related risks. Broader discussions are expected on Wednesday, with more countries, including China, attending the in-person ministerial session alongside the AI Global Forum to include a wider range of businesses and civil society. Oh Young, Arirang News. And speaking about the broader society, so what are the thoughts of people in different professions about the risks and rewards of AI? Our An Sung Jin has some answers. Artificial intelligence has been around for a while. Some believe that the use of AI can help them save time and allow them to focus on more important things. Uh, the tasks you enjoy doing, do those. The tasks you don't enjoy doing, find a way to get AI to help you. you know, make... I think AI will be used even more in the future. It can help with things like research, tasks that are a bit tedious. According to Microsoft's latest report, three out of four people use AI in their work. In Korea, it's nearly 73 percent. AI is no longer seen as a technological disruption, but rather a force of transformation. One expert says that our use of AI, as well as the problems that derive from it, are inevitable. One is social innovation, and the other is an increase in productivity. 
That's why we use AI. It's good at things that humans were previously unable to do. However, as AI becomes more sophisticated and widespread, danger follows such as deep fakes, loss of jobs and privacy violation issues. The same expert added that as the use of AI accelerates, social consensus is needed to regulate it. There is a need for an international organization that can control the use of it, which establishes a social consensus between profit and privacy control for AI. Another expert agrees and also cautions how it's not merely about creating regulations. The easy answer is we write the law or the regulation to target the appropriate part of AI. But I think the, the better answer, the more complex, the key is making sure that the regulation is appropriately scoped. Our use of AI is only going to increase as it becomes woven into the fabric of our lives. But guidance and regulations are needed for its proper integration into our daily lives. Han Songjin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, President Yoon Suk-yeol says freedom and solidarity will end the tunnel of global uncertainty. The remarks were made during this year's Asian Leadership Conference here in the country under the theme of the era of hyper-uncertainty, innovative leadership for the new future. He also touched upon Korea's dismal birth rate, adding that this concern is not simply a domestic issue, but one that affects many other countries as well. That being said, he voiced hopes of seeking to better address the low birth rate and of sharing the lessons learned with Korea's counterparts. Beyond Borders, Russia has started exercises simulating the launch of its tactical nuclear weapons as earlier announced by its authorities. Our Lee sin has details. Russia's Ministry of Defense announced Tuesday that under the instructions of Russian President Vladimir Putin, the first phase of tactical nuclear drills has begun in Russia's southern military district. The military drills, which are also taking place near Ukraine, simulate the use of nuclear weapons. The move is a response to what Moscow says are threats from the West and a message not to escalate tensions any further. The ministry explained that the tactical nuclear drills include training using the Iskander short-range ballistic missiles and the Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, which are capable of carrying nuclear warheads. Earlier this month, Putin ordered the defense ministry to prepare training to test the use of tactical nuclear weapons after the Kremlin took issue with comments made by French President Emmanuel Macron, who mentioned the possibility of sending troops to Ukraine. They also slammed British Foreign Secretary David Cameron, who said that weapons provided to Ukraine could be used to strike the Russian mainland. During his Victory Day speech earlier this month, Putin warned the West that its strategic forces are always ready for combat at all times and indicated that Russian and Belarusian forces have begun joint preparations for tactical nuclear weapons training. Russia's defense ministry on Tuesday released footage showing trucks carrying missiles to a field where launch systems had been set up. The military drills are taking place in Russia's southern military district in Rostov-on-Don, near the Ukrainian border, as well as the Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Herozon regions, which Russia claims were newly incorporated during its special military operation against Ukraine. Lee seung Arirang News. And Russia launched an anti-satellite weapon into orbit near a U.S. government satellite late last week. The allegation was made by Ambassador Rob Wood, the U.S. alternate representative for special political affairs at the U.N. earlier this week during a Security Council debate on a Russian resolution proposing a ban on the placement of weapons in space. The resolution itself failed to secure the necessary votes to ensure its passing. The U.S. Defense Department, meanwhile, is tracking the Russian anti-satellite weapon, which reportedly follows similar launches by Moscow back in the years 2019 and 2022. In the Middle East, relief workers are sounding the alarm in Gaza as essential food delivery into the southern city of Rafa is suspended amid supply shortages and security concerns. Our Kim Bogyang reports. Catastrophe nightmare. This is how one United Nations official described the situation in Rafa, calling it hell on earth. After Israel closed the Palestinian side of the Rafah land crossing with Egypt earlier this month, the humanitarian situation has been worsening. According to the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees on Tuesday, 
Food distribution in Gaza's southern city of Rafah has been suspended due to a lack of supplies. Saying the impact of incursions and evacuation orders are being felt all over Gaza, the head of the World Health Organization called on Israel to lift restrictions on aid into Gaza on Tuesday. At a time when the people of Gaza are facing starvation, we urge Israel to lift the blockade and to let aid through. The UN World Food Program is reportedly re-evaluating logistics, looking for alternative routes within Gaza after deliveries from a U.S.-made pier stopped on Sunday. U.S. President Joe Biden previously ordered the American military's construction of the pier and dock, and the first 10 trucks had entered through the pier on Friday. But this ended up chaotic, with much of the aid looted and one Palestinian man dead, resulting in the aid deliveries being stopped. The WFP said that the peer project for delivering aid to Gaza may fail unless Israel starts providing the conditions the humanitarian groups need to operate safely. Meanwhile, Israel on Tuesday shut down the Associated Press's live camera feed as Israel claimed that the news agency was providing Al Jazeera with content. Israel's communications department returned camera and broadcast equipment it had seized from the media outlet after facing a backlash from U.S. officials and press groups. This comes weeks after Israel shut down Al Jazeera's operations in the country, citing a recently approved law that enables it to temporarily close four networks in Israel that are considered a threat to national security. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. Korea's producer prices rose for the fifth month in a row in April. According to the Bank of Korea on this Wednesday, April's producer price index gained 0.3 percent on month after a hike in prices for services and industrial goods. In contrast, prices of agricultural, forestry and fisheries products fell 3 percent on year. The producer price index is a key indicator of the scope of inflation as producer prices affect the prices that businesses charge their customers. Inflation here in Korea rose 2.9 percent in April, marking the first time in three months for the figure to hover below 3 percent. Korea's household debt shrank in the first quarter of 2024 for the first time in a year. Our correspondent Moon hye covers this reality and the reasons behind it. Household debt fell for the first time in a year in South Korea amid high borrowing costs and the sluggish real estate market. According to preliminary data released by the Bank of Korea on Tuesday, outstanding household credit in the first quarter of the year fell by 0.1 percent, some 2.5 trillion Korean won or over 1.8 billion U.S. dollars, compared to the previous quarter. As a result, it stood at over $1.3 trillion by the end of March. Household credit is an umbrella term for household debt that combines loans from banks and other financial institutions with merchandise credit, including credit card bills that have not been paid off. This is the first time since this period last year that this figure has logged an on-quarter decline, with household credit having increased from the second quarter of last year. Looking at household loans alone, the figure fell by around $146 million on quarter, again logging the first on-quarter drop in a year. And the reason behind this was seen in an increase in mortgage loans that was lower than the previous quarter. The Bank of Korea explained that a decrease in the supply of policy loans and housing transactions around the end of last year affected housing loans in the first quarter. It also commented on the country's ongoing issue of household debt to GDP ratio, seeing that it has seen a trend of it falling annually in 2022 and 2023, and expects the trend to continue in the first quarter of this year. Moon hye Arirang News. A strong alcoholic drink that is making the global rounds as we speak is Korea's soju. That being said, our Lee Soo Jin shares with us the two main types of soju with her focus on the premium variety. Do take a look. The buzz is in the bottle and at this local distillery, it's a distilled soju buzz. From France's Champagne to Mexico's tequila, there are countries that have their signature alcohol products. For South Korea, 
It's Soju, which has been making a name for itself worldwide. The value of Soju exports surpassed the 100 million U.S. dollar mark for the first time in 10 years in 2023. But what's behind its growing global popularity? I think it was in K-dramas. Like it's really good and like they have different flavors as well. I had heard a lot about it through word of mouth. Like my friend that I'm here with and my sister are very into the Korean culture. There are two main methods for producing soju. One that makes distilled soju considered to be a more traditional variety. And the other is diluted soju, which is more commercially available in the famous green tinted bottles. But local companies believe that it's a lesser-known distilled soju that will drive exports in the future because of its higher quality. We're currently exporting to 25 different countries and planning to focus on expanding these because we believe that demand for premium distilled alcohol will continue growing. One of the reasons causing the difference in quality is the type of raw ingredients that are used. Diluted soju is often made from imported tapioca, which is cheaper than distilled soju's locally produced rice that's steamed under pressure before undergoing two rounds of fermentation. And once the fermentation processes are completed, the distillation process is carried out, just once for distilled soju. On the other hand, diluted soju is made from a concentrate that has been distilled several times to increase the alcohol content. While higher alcohol content means that more soju can be produced from the concentrate, the numerous distillations cause it to lose its natural flavor, making the addition of artificial sweeteners necessary, unlike distilled soju. And here, the quality is further enhanced by preserving the soju in traditional earthenwares for three months to maximize the flavor. With local distilleries like this targeting consumer behavior that's shifting to rank quality above price, Distilled soju and its traditional processing methods are expected to gain more recognition worldwide. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. In other news, Korea's OECD partners have made note of its commitment to better assisting developing nations in recent years. Our Choi Min-jung has more. South Korea is well on its way to increasing its influence and presence in the international community. The OECD's Development Assistance Committee on Tuesday credited South Korea's development cooperation efforts in a peer review, held once every five to six years. It said South Korea is at a pivotal juncture as it rapidly scales up official development assistance and assumes more global responsibility. The latest report praised the country's steady increase in the ODA budget and the diversification of assistance. South Korea's ODA budget for this year is at a record high of 6.3 trillion won, equal to some 4.6 billion U.S. dollars. This is a 31 percent increase from the previous year. Deputy Director of the Office for Government Policy Coordination, Park gu said the hike comes in line with the country's efforts to fulfill its responsibilities as a global pivotal state in the international community. The peer review provides a set of recommendations for Korea to strengthen strategic partnerships with partners, such as increasing the number of qualified staff working in development across government and delegating more authority to partner country offices. South Korea has gradually increased its ODA budget since joining the committee in 2010. The country ranked 14th among 31 member countries in terms of ODA size in 2023. Choi Min-dong, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. One person was killed and at least 30 were injured on Tuesday when Singapore Airlines flight SQ321, flying from London to Singapore, was hit with severe turbulence, forcing an emergency landing in Bangkok. Authorities at Bangkok Airport named a dead man as 73-year-old British national Jeff Kitchen, who is suspected to have died from a heart attack. Seven people are also in critical condition after the plane experienced a sudden and dramatic loss of altitude of over 1,800 meters. The Boeing 777 Singapore Airlines flight with 211 passengers and 18 crew members fell into an air pocket while traveling above Myanmar as cabin crew were serving in-flight breakfasts. One passenger recounted that anyone not wearing a seatbelt was launched into the ceiling 
while another said many were seen injured, including with head wounds. The flight arrived in Singapore at approximately 5.30 a.m. local time. The airline said 79 passengers and 11 crew members remain in Bangkok, where they are receiving treatment. French President Emmanuel Macron is set to make a surprise visit to New Caledonia amid unrest in the French overseas territory, which has led to at least six deaths, including two police officers and injuries to hundreds more. A French government spokesperson said, following a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, that Macron would leave as soon as this evening to embark on the 17,000-kilometer journey. Violence and looting erupted in New Caledonia on May 13th, when France announced new rules that would give voting rights to tens of thousands of non-indigenous residents of the islands, which have a population of around 270,000. Tensions have built up over decades between the indigenous Kanaks, who seek independence from France, and the descendants of French colonizers who want to remain a part of France. U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump has taken down a 30-second video posted on his Truth social account that made a reference to a unified Reich, language often associated with Nazi Germany. The video, which was posted on Monday afternoon local time, was no longer available by Tuesday early morning. The clip begins by saying what happens if Donald Trump wins, and one of the headings on a mocked-up newspaper reads, industrial strength and production had significantly increased after 1871, driven by the creation of a unified Reich. Germany was unified as an empire in that year. The word Reich, which means empire, is now often associated with Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler, who declared the Third Reich. Trump's spokesperson, Carolyn Levitt, said that the video was created by a random account online and that the staff who posted it did not see the word Reich. Lawyers representing actress Scarlett Johansson have contacted OpenAI to question how it is that the firm's new GPT-40 chatbot's voice bears a close resemblance to the Hollywood stars. Johansson said Monday that the chatbot, which has been called Sky, sounded eerily similar to her, even though she declined an offer from OpenAI CEO Sam Altman last September to use her voice. She added that Altman insinuated that the similarity was intentional in a social media post referencing Johansson's 2013 movie, Her, in which she plays the voice of an AI assistant. Altman told Reuters that Sky's voice belonged to a different professional actress and was not an imitation of Johansson. The AI company said it would no longer use the voice for undisclosed reasons. Kim Jiang, Arirang News. Good afternoon. As the summer season is right around the corner, most places are having a taste of summer weather in advance. And for today, the capital area gets slight relief from the heat. But the rest of the country needs to brace for a big rise in highs, even on the East Coast this afternoon. The hazy morning has turned much brighter with strong sunlight. UV rays should be very strong pretty much everywhere except in Toledo provinces. So sun safety is a must today. I mean, many health experts are stressing that unprotected exposure to the sun's UV rays can cause damage to the skin, eyes, and immune system. Remember, these are inexpensive but wise and easy ways to stay safe from the sun. Sunshine and heat for the day. Most regions are having highs that are 1 to 8 degrees higher this afternoon at 29 degrees in Daegu, 30 degrees in Gyeongju. Now the conditions should stay warm and sunny through early Sunday. Then nationwide rain is in the forecast for Sunday afternoon into early Monday. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions.
Right, and that ends our Wednesday afternoon newscast. Coming up right after this break is our daily panel session, and today we touch upon human development here in Korea and elsewhere.